Hi, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue reporting for Medscape. Joining me today, I've got Dr. Marco Valgamigli, um, who is an extraordinary leader in the field of, of antiplatelet therapy. Um, he's from Lugano, Switzerland, and we are just wrapping up the ESC Congress. And one of the, the big topics of conversation was the results of a, a trial that, that he led, um, the Master DAP trial, um, which was an investigator initiated study. And I, I know his passion for, for several years. So we're gonna talk about um, that trial and its practice implications. Um, there's been a lot of, of chat about that. Um, so welcome, Marco. Thank you very much, Michelle, for having me. So perhaps as a first step, would you like to walk people through the, the study design? I, I know that the results have also just been published in the New England Journal. So again, congratulations. Thank you very much. So we set up the study a few years ago, actually to focus on patients who are at high risk for bleeding complications who are undergoing a PCI for either chronic or acute coronary syndrome. The key question in our mind was how long should we go for DAPT? There have been a lot of retrospective studies showing that perhaps specifically in HBR patient, the DPT duration could be actually shortened without compromising safety and gaining with respect to bleeding liability. But in fact, no prospective study had before ever tested that. Therefore, we put together roughly uh, 4,500 patients. They were all treated with a specific stent, which is a, a bioresorbable serolimus looting stent, Ultimaster. And then if and when they were free from recurrent ischemic events 30 days after PCI, they were eligible to get into the study where they either stopped immediately the EPT and continue with a single antiplatelet therapy, or they were supposed to continue the EPT for at least two or five months, depending on whether they had or did not have a concomitant indication to oral anticoagulation. And then afterwards, the upper limit of the EPT duration in the control group was basically at discretion of the treating physician, but simply provided the lower limit. And afterwards, they continue with the single antiplatelet therapy as well. Now, perhaps it's important to state up front that SAPT in our study was both either aspirin or P2Y12 inhibitor. And the call for the type of P2Y12 inhibitor was completely open for the investigators to choose. And we, in fact, we had a quite interesting mix of uh, different agents. We yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was going to just uh, emphasize some of the points that you just made. So I think that you know one of the important things was this was a very large scale study. Um, you know, so so more than four thousand patients um, enrolled. Um, so certainly a huge contribute contribution in that regard. Um, and also, you know, I think that building upon the earlier results of, for instance, the DAP trial that um, we had a few years ago, um, th this was more modern stent technology. Um, you know, so we can talk a little bit about whether we think that. Uh, the uh, findings are generalizable to other stent types afterwards, um, but I think nonetheless, it, it's a more um, updated uh, trial that I, I think is, is very relevant. And then also, this was specific to high bleeding risk patients, um, you know, so Correct. again... That's an important feature. So we wanted to have a sort of an old camera HBR population, but by no means patient without HBR feature. I think that's very important to emphasize. Yeah, and I think that you had an interesting approach in terms of um, allowing sites to manage the antiplatelet therapy as they wanted when they were dropping an agent. So as you pointed out, you had a mix of people who were going to be on aspirin monotherapy um, and P2I12 inhibitor monotherapy. And there was also a mix of people who were or were not on an oral anticoagulant as, as background as well. That is correct. So uh, oral anticoagulation was actually one of the 10 HBR features that we listed. So if a patient had an indication to oral anticoagulation could be part of the study. But in fact, the mean HBR per patient was 2.1, meaning that the majority of patients had actually more than one HBR criteria. Great. So if we're going to walk through the top line findings, um, you know, what did sure. you find? We had three primary points, which we pre-specified to actually test in the following order. First, non-inferiority for NASE which was the compass of death, MI, stroke, and major bleeding, which was met. Therefore, we could go forward to test the non-inferiority for maize, death, MI, stroke, which was also met with a both, in both cases, actually highly significant p-value. So I think the non-inferiority endpoints is always a bit tricky, but I think in that study is particularly robust. That's at least the way I see it, acknowledging my own bias. Therefore, we were allowed to get the, to go ahead and test the superiority for major or non-major clinical relevant bleeding complication, which was met. And in fact, we had a highly significant p-value, a difference in cumulative incidence close to 3% and a number needed to treat for benefit of uh, 35. It's probably fair to acknowledge, though, that unlike our expectation, the bleeding benefit came from bar 2, actually not much from bar 3. 
There was a trend favoring abbreviated DPT, but not quite as much reaching any statistical significance. And we had two fatal bleeding events with abbreviated eight in the standard DPT group. So the, the bleeding benefit really came from BARC2, which was a sort of unexpected, I have to say. Yeah, and, and that was an observation that was made also um, when you did the presentation as well. And I, I think it is interesting because, you know, I think that everyone expected that, of course, abbreviated DAPT would be uh, associated with, with less bleeding. Um, but perhaps people would have thought that ma major bleeds, the, the BARC 3 to 5, the most severe ones, um, would have been significantly reduced as well. Yeah, that was our expectation. I think the explanation is coming from the fact that in the control group first, we gave lower limit of DPT duration to create some sort of contrast between the two arms. But at the end, we left free the investigators to prolong DPT as much as they wanted. On average, in the control group, DPT was five to six months after stent implantation was not 12 months, which in my mind probably explains the finding. So I think overall, you saw with abbreviated DAPT that there was less bleeding um, and that uh, it was very reassuring in terms of MACE. We didn't see any clear uptick um, in the incidence of, of MACE for an abbreviated DAPT regimen. Um, I know that you also have the publications that just came out simultaneously in circulation as well, looking at background use of an oral anticoagulant. Um, and overall, it looks like irrespective of whether or not people were on an oral anticoagulant, that the results were, again, grossly similar, that there was no clear uptick um, in you MACE. Did, you, did, you did a great summary. I think the results are mainly consistent, actually, for both uh, of the three, uh, for all three co-primary points. So in respect to whether the patient had or did not have an indication to order regulation, the results were quite solid. And I also would like to point out that beyond MACE per se, acknowledging that this is a secondary point, but we were quite surprised also to see the CBA rates being lower with the abbreviated DPT. Actually, that was due to both lower ischemic and hemorrhagic cerebral events. So I think the, 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 the latter was perhaps uh, to be expected, but the former was a bit of a surprise. Yeah, I saw that as well. That, that was interesting. So yeah. as we think, take a step back and think about the clinical implications for those who are watching, um, you know, I, I know that you had the different strategies for abbreviated DAPT, what that actually meant in practice. Um, and the majority of patients were on clopidogrel monotherapy. So right. the aspirin was being discontinued. Do you think that that is the preferred strategy um, or, you know, does it depend on the patient? You know, is this only for a high bleeding risk patient where you think clopidogrel monotherapy should be considered? When should it be ticagrelor monotherapy and when should it be aspirin? I have to say that I was a bit surprised when I saw the breakdown of the type of P2 Y12 inhibitor because probably my practice will be more uh, Clopidogrel monotherapy if a patient is stable and perhaps ticagrel or prasugam monotherapy if the patient is in SES. That would be my practice. But the investigators gave another feedback. It's a clear domination of clopidogrel, both monotherapy in the experimental arm and on in the DPT form in, in the control arm. Probably speaking for the fact that we really target the HBR patient. However, despite the theoretical concern of leaving a clopidogrel, which is an inconsistent P2 Y12 inhibitor as a monotherapy, the study actually proved uh, basically that these concerns were not uh, solid. There was no clear excess of ischemic events. We had an excess of 11 MI in the abbreviated DPT, but also a gain of 11 strokes in the abbreviated DPT, which explained the fact that the mates are pretty much uh, neutral. So uh, we also had presented at ESC the results of the ACS subgroup from Stop DAPT, which was a trial looking at a strategy of clopidogrel monotherapy um, as compared with, with standard DAPT. Um, and there, there did appear to be um, an excess in, in MI events. Overall, the trial was neutral, um, but within the, the um, ACS subgroup, there, there was that uptick. So perhaps to your point, I mean, we know that there exists significant interpatient variability in response to clopidogrel. Um, so perhaps clopidogrel monotherapy would not be a preferred strategy for an ACS patient. You know, maybe their ticagrelor monotherapy um, would, would be more appropriate. Is, is that your thought as well? It is completely my thought, yes. I think you did a great summary. So at the end of the day, we need to simplify treatment and try to be as short as possible, but perhaps not too short and not too simplistic in the approach. We already knew in the SES population that both 
take agro and prasel on top of aspirin are much better off than aspirin and clopidogrel. So if you leave aspirin out of the picture, thinking that you can get away without any rebound of ischemic risk, just with clopidogrel monotherapy, I think it's a bit too much. <clears throat> if you are not justified by concern about bleeding risk, I think clopidogrel should not be there. I don't see that treatment option completely justified. Now, perhaps the sweet spot is really take agro monotherapy for which we have uh, data, robust data. Theoretically, even prostate monotherapy would, would be a great choice. It's a QD, it's a very long half-life. The problem is that we have hardly data on prostate monotherapy. They are probably coming, but there are many studies that are running with prostate monotherapy. So I think the future for ACS patient is monotherapy with the potent and most importantly, reliable p 2 so more than clopidogrel, which to me is justified only if the risk of bleeding is far greater than the risk of ischemic events, which in an unselected ACS CS population is not clearly the case. And do you think that this extends beyond the stent type that you studied within MasterDAP? Do you think that this would be broadly applicable to, to all patients who are stented? Well, that, that is difficult to say. For sure, newer generation DS are much safer than the stent types, which, uh, to name it, uh, has been uh, been tested in the APT. So when I think about taxes and stent cipher, stent, uh, a cipher stent, of course, uh, we are speaking about uh, two different stent types whose uh, profile, risk safety profile is completely different. Whether there are minor differences among the latest generation DES, which perhaps are uh, coming up and pop up when you are decreasing the APT is completely unknown. The only number I can share with you is that we had 99.8% of stand being ultimaster, so it's pretty much uniform. We had something like 15 non-ultimaster stand implanted, and out of these 15 stands, we had two stand thromboses. We had 18 stent thrombosis overall in the study, and actually two occurred in non ultimaster stent. So the study cannot really answer whether these results are reproducible with other stent platforms. Acknowledging that it seems all of them quite safe, I have to say. Well, I think the, the trial builds importantly upon re prior research. And as you indicated, I mean, this landscape is continuing to evolve so quickly. Who would have thought a few years ago that aspirin would be the drug we'd be routinely discontinuing? Um, you know, for, for patients when we think about abbreviated DAPT regimens, but I think we're headed in that, in that direction. And ultimately, okay. we'll need to think about long-term therapy too. You know, how do we treat a patient who is now a couple of years post-ACS? Are we going to continue them on P2I12 inhibitor monotherapy indefinitely, um, or will we? That is also my preference. I have to say, acknowledging that the data is much more limited, but host exam study, for example, recently presented and published, is really supportive of clopidogrel monotherapy better than aspirin monotherapy. And in that context, probably I asked myself whether a sweet spot could be prasugar 5 or take agro 60 monotherapy as a long-term treatment. But unfortunately, we don't have data there. Well, there's room for your next investigator-initiated trial there, Marco. So yeah, take one month off and then I can start thinking. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I think it's been a great discussion and, and certainly we'll stay tuned for, for more analyses coming from MasterDAPT, I'm sure. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Signing off from Medscape, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue.